Hello everyone, this is Mike Howard and I am here with Beverly Howard. We're going to do another Bible study. We're in the 13th lesson in the book of Genesis. We're halfway through. The title of the lesson is Purged. It deals with God's destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So just a few weeks ago, we were seeing Noah and the ark. So I think the purpose of these two uh, lessons is to let us know that judgment really is coming and that we do have a way out. So God judged the world and Noah was the righteous man who led his family out. Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot is the righteous man. In Nineveh, God was going to judge Nineveh, but he sent Jonah and because of his preaching, Nineveh repented. And then Jerusalem, Jeremiah told them that they were guilty of the same sins as Sodom and they needed to repent, uh, but they did not. So then there's going to be a final judgment. And in this judgment, the righteous man is Jesus. Now, if you take a look at those things, what you find out is that uh, those who had a righteous man to lead them out made it out, but those cities that were told to repent eventually came back to destruction. So uh, that happened in Nineveh. So what triggered this judgment? It was the same thing that was going on uh, in the days of Noah. There was sexual depravity. We see in Ezekiel 16, uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah both uh, detail the sins that were going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. There was violence against each other. We'll see that. Both the sexual depravity and the violence, we'll see. And then the arrogance with no concern for the poor and needy. We're not going to see that uh, too much in the lesson today, but apparently it was there. And then they were haughty. They were proud uh, of themselves, and they were not uh, deferential to God. And we'll see that in the way they treat Lot. So that's what triggered the judgment. And the way of the escape, of course, like I said, is a righteous man for Noah, a righteous man for Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, a righteous man for the world and Jesus. And then if you take a look at Nineveh and Jerusalem, they repented, but unfortunately the world continued their downward spiral and Nineveh was eventually destroyed. Jerusalem has been destroyed twice. Uh, so, and that's God's chosen people. So the not much hope for the world unless there's a righteous man. So Lot's dangerous journey. Lot was attracted to Sodom. You remember he and Abraham uh, ran out of pasture space and their servants were arguing. So uh, Abraham said to Lot, hey, look, uh, there's not enough room here. You need to go one place and I'll go the other. And so Lot looked down to the plain where there was a lot of pasture land and grass. And that was the plain where Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities were. And he said, I think I'll go there. There's plenty of grass down there. So Lot was attracted to Sodom for its what it had to offer. And then he went down with his flocks, his servants, and he pitched his tents not far from the city of Sodom. But as the years go by, we find that Lot has moved from his tents into the city and bought a house in Sodom. He's settled down, he's married, and he's raised raised a family. He has two daughters that are marrying, marrying age. So Lot goes from, it looks attractive, to I think I'll move close by to where, hey, I think I'll just go ahead and move in. And then, oh, by the way, I think this is going to be my, my new home. So where is this place? Well, Hebron is where... Uh, Abraham and Lot were living, and that's where Abraham is still living at this point in the story. And then if you come uh, west of the mountain range here, you'll find this plain uh, that's bordered by the mountains and the Dead Sea. And in that plain, uh, we think, were the cities of Sodom. It makes sense in the story, Sodom and Gomorrah. So it's about, they think, the location is about 20 miles from Hebron, and uh, one of the scriptures says that uh, after God uh, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Abraham looked out and he saw the smoke rising, and it, the, it being he was a, he was probably over a thousand feet high, uh, that's easy to understand that you could see as far as probably around 70 miles, but it was only 20 miles there. It's kind of a detail. So this particular story starts in chapter 19, verse 1. <clears throat> now, the focal verses don't start till 12, but I tried to figure out a way of 
of doing the preface to the story. And what I landed on was God does a really good job in his word. So I thought I would just put the scripture in and read it to you. And then you'll be caught up by the time we get to verse 12. See, but it's going to mean that there are a lot of slides. So bear with me. If English is not your first language, I'm sorry that I'm going so fast. So there, remember, there were three people that came to visit Abraham, uh, and th that's when they told Abraham and Sarah that she was going to be pregnant. And then God stays and chats with Abraham while he sends the two angels further, well, to uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, now they're there in chapter 19, verse 1. The two angels have now arrived at, so at Sodom, and the it's the evening by this time, and Lot was sitting at the gateway to the city. And that implies or it indicates that not only has Lot moved into the city, he's taken a leadership role, uh, at maybe a city council type of job in the city. So he's fully involved in this place. So he's at the gateway of the city. And when he saw, he, Lot saw these angels, he knew that they were special. So he got up to meet them and he bowed down with his face to the ground. That's how we know that he knew that they were kind of supernatural. So Lot uh, then urges the angels to come home with him. He says, my lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet there and you can spend the night with me. And then you can go on your way early in the morning. And their reply to Lot was, no, we're going to spend the night here in the public square. Well, Lot knew exactly what was going to happen to him. So he insisted. Lot insisted so strongly that they did go with him and they entered into his house and he, while they were there, he prepared uh, the, the uh, King James says a feast, but it was a big meal. He prepared for them baking bread without yeast because it's getting late in the evening, didn't have time for the bread to rise. So he just baked it without yeast and then they ate dinner and now they're preparing to go to bed. But then darkness comes and darkness truly does come. The deeds of darkness emerge in a wicked city before the two angels and Lot and his family have gone to bed. All the men from every part of the city of Sodom, the young men and the old men, surrounded the house. And then they called out to Lot, who's sitting on the inside, where are the men that came with you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Well, that's not a good idea. So Lot pleads with his friends. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him. And he said, no, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. And we read in James chapter four, verse four, that friendship with the world is enmity toward God. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. Well, Lot has slipped into becoming a friend of the world here. No, my friends, don't do such a wicked thing. I've got a better idea. Don't rape these two angels that are that have come into town. Instead, let me give you my two virgin daughters to rape. How does that make any sense, Lot? Look, he says, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do whatever you like with them, but don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of my roof. Two steps forward, one step back. Now, when you read this, you think to yourself, how evil have you become Lot? But really, Lot has just become incredibly confused by the culture that he's living in. And that, too, is a lesson for us if we're not careful. Verse 9, they respond to Lot's offer. Hey, take my two daughters versus these two men. They respond this way, get out of our way, they replied, this fellow, and they're talking about Lot, oh now, this fellow came here as a foreigner, in other words, he, he moved down here with his sheep and his tents, and so he came to us, he wasn't one of us, he just came to us as a foreigner, and now that he lives here, he wants to play judge, and then they say to Lot, we'll treat you worse than we're proposing to treat the two visitors. So we don't want to rape your daughters. We want to rape the two men. And if you don't shut up and give us what we want, we'll do worse than that to you. And they kept on bringing pressure to Lot and they moved forward so that they were going to break down the door. But then the angels saved Lot's life for the first time. Verse 10, but the men, the angels, 
inside the house, reached out. They pulled Lot back into the house and they shut the door. And then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old. Remember, these are all the men in Sodom. They struck them with blindness so that they could not find the door. Now, that's, they're already morally and ethically blind. And so now the angels strike them with physical blindness. And remember what Jesus said. He said, I came to give sight to the blind. But the angels struck them blind, and it says here, with blindness so that they could not find the door. And Jesus says, I am the door. So there's a lot of meaning in these verses. And God offers to save others. He offers to Lot through the angels. He says, the two men said to Lot, do you have anyone else here? Son, Sons-in-law, sons or daughters, anyone else in the city who belongs to you? because we need to get them out of here. The reason that we need to get them out is because we're about to destroy this place. And the reason is the outcry to the Lord, people have been suffering so much against these people that it's so great that God has sent us to destroy the city. And like Noah tried to remind or to, to alert his neighbors Lot also tries to do that with his sons-in-laws. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. And he said to them, hurry and get out of this place. I'm warning you because God is about to destroy the city. The end is near. And you know what people do when they see people standing with a sign that says, the end is near. They always laugh and point. They think it's a joke. And his sons-in-law thought he was joking. So now it's the time for judgment. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot. They said, hurry, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, and you, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. And when Lot hesitated, see, this is more of what happens when you invest yourself in the world. If you're a Christian, and you get too close to the world, you get too in love with the world, and it's so hard for the Holy Spirit to pull you away from the world. And so a lot hesitated, and the men grasped his hand. They weren't going to leave him there. They grasped his hand in the hands of his wife and his two daughters. It's a good thing there were two angels. There were four people that needed to be pulled away, and he led them out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. And then the angels give them instructions. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere on the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. And once again, Lot takes a step back. He says, but Lot said to them, no, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life and my family's life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will surely overtake me and I'll die. And Lot at this point is getting up in years. And so he offers the two angels an alternative. He says, look, there's a town near enough to run to. It's small. Let me flee to it. It's very small. It is, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. Okay, I understand the big city is corrupted, but these little small towns, that, that's okay, right? And so the angels relented. They said, okay, very well, I'll grant you this request too. I will not overthrow the town that you speak of, but whatever you do, flee quickly because I can't do anything until you reach that small town. And then they go on, the commentary is, that is why the town is called Zor, or Zoar, which means little in Hebrew. So by the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Now it's time. The Lord rained down some burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus, he overthrew these cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land, whether it's people or animals or grass or trees. It was all destroyed. But then Lot's wife. But Lot's wife looked back. She still couldn't turn loose. Now, we aren't told whether Lot's wife was from 
uh, Sodom. Uh, it's kind of implied because she wasn't spoken of before he's moved into Sodom. So assuming that she was born in Sodom, this was her home and this is where she grew up and this is where her extended family probably lived. So she was terrified and she turned back. She was still had attachments to the city. But by looking back, when the angel told her not to, she became a pillar of salt. Now, why is this a lesson for us? Well, if you go on to when Jesus is talking about that final judgment, the day of the Lord, the day when the Lord brings fire to the world, we're told he's telling us there in Luke chapter 17, don't look back. Don't. God's going to come and take you out, but don't look back for anything. And then he goes on to say, remember Lot's wife. There's no more city life for Lot. Look what Lot finally does. Once he sees, <laughs> he thought, well, let's just let me go to this little small town. And then he sees the fire from heaven and the destruction and the flames and the smoke and the smell, the total destruction. And when Lot sees that, he goes, maybe they're right. Maybe I should give up city living altogether. Maybe it is time to move back to the mountains. So Lot and his two daughters left Zoar and settled in the mountains for he was what? He was now afraid to stay in any kind of town. So that's it. That's the story. It's a terrible, terrible story. But there are lessons to be learned. What are they? Well, the lesson for us today is this. It's a summary of the lesson, the world or God. First John tells us in chapter two, verses 15, 16, and 17, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, then the love for the Father can't be in them. For everything in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, sounds just like Sodom. And the pride of life, their arrogance and their... Uh, haughtiness. That doesn't come from the Father. It comes from the world. The world and its desires, like Sodom and Gomorrah, are going to pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, how bad was Lot? Well, it turns out that Lot was a good man, a righteous man, who got too close to the world. And you can see that in Jerusalem, in the Israel. You can see that in Lot. You can see that in the church at Laodicea. It's all there as a warning to us not to get too close to the world or fall in love with the world because of all these reasons. Peter gives us this insight about Lot, though, and I think that's beautiful because it's going to tell us something else for us. He says in 2 Peter verses chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, God rescued Lot because he was a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. For that righteous man living among these lawless people day after day was what? Tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds that he saw and he heard. That's Peter talking about Lot. And that's why Lot tried to save the two angels in a flawed way. So how do we apply this to our lives? Well, I think it's time for us to do a spiritual checkup. Are we in love with the world? Well, the way you can tell is, are you tormented by the lawlessness and the depravity that you see around us? If you live in the United States and you look at our government and the soon to come elections, and you're not completely tormented by all of the lawlessness that you see, throughout our cities in this nation. And if you aren't concerned about the proposed leadership in Washington, D.C., if none of that bothers you, then you're probably in love with the world. But if you're tormented by the way people are being treated, if you're tormented by the direction of our country or whatever country you live in, if the lawlessness and the wickedness and the violence against the helpless, if that bothers you, if it troubles you, if it keeps you up at night, that's a good check because Lot was feeling that too. There's a great quote from MacArthur that Beverly found for me. 
And this is MacArthur talking about heaven. He says, when people ask me what appeals to me about heaven, I tell them it's not the streets of transparent gold or the gates made of pearls. It's the absence of sin. And MacArthur says, I'm really tired of sin. Are you tired of sin? I'm sick to death of sin. If you're a Christian and you're not sick to death of sin, you're too in love with the world. J.D. Greer, I was going to try to figure out how do, we, how do I write slides that explain how we apply this. And part of my reading to study the lesson, I came across an article from J.D. Greer. Now, J.D. Greer uh, is a pastor of a church in Virginia, and he was a past president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He's a great preacher. And uh, he wrote an article, called, and I'll put it in the uh, comments. I'll, I'll put the, the link to it in the comments. Uh, the description, I'm sorry, not the comments. Uh, J.D. Greer wrote an article called Surviving, Surviving Sodom. And these are three of his points. Number one point is beware of the progression of sin in your life. And you, I know you can't read this. It's too small. I can barely read it here. You must make up your mind. Who do you really want to be? Where do you really belong? If it's with the world, then go with the world 100%. But if it's with God, go with God 100%. So beware of the progression of sin in your life. Lot drifted into it. Second point he makes is the coming judgment is real. The greatest hypocrisy of all time is saying that you believe in heaven and hell and not doing everything within your power that you can to, care, to keep those you care about from going there. The third point he makes is you cannot drift into godliness. Now, I thought this was a great point. It's like uh, <laughs> you, godliness is a struggle. It's a struggle to shed this world. It's like if you think about culture, you think about being in an inner tube, you're drifting down the current of the river. And he says this, living for Jesus in this world will always feel like an uphill battle. So you got to go to the mountains, okay? Because you are going against the current. And everything in the world will pull you into the other direction. If you're not actively fighting, you are drifting the wrong way like Lot in Sodom. I thought those were three great points. So the struggle then is our direction. We're either faced eastward toward the world, like Lot, toward Sodom, or we're faced westward, we're facing toward God. We've repented, we've turned, and we're now headed towards the mountains. And if we're not faced 100% towards either one of those, then we're faced toward both, and that's called being lukewarm, and that's what the church at Laodicea was. So you've got this choice. You can go the narrow path, the uphill battle, the struggle against sin in the world, or you can go the broad way, downhill, downstream, and just float along and drift. But you've got to choose one or the other. You either enter through the narrow gate, for the wide is that gate, it's easy, or you can go through the narrow gate, and that leads to life and life eternal. So there it is. Jesus says it this way. Same way the angel said to Lot, come with me if you want to live. I am the gate. Pray with me. Father, in the first 20 chapters, we see two huge judgments against, against violence and hatred and treating each other badly and not treating you like God and not loving you or loving others. Father, we see your judgment come quickly and we know that we live in a world that's going downstream and we know that if we don't swim against the current, if we don't face you, if we don't allow you to pull us away from the destruction that we too will be subject to this terrible punishment. So Father, for, for us, we know Jesus. Father, help us to be all about telling others that we know the way to escape the sure-to-come judgment. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Well, next week less, week's lesson, we find Abraham having to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Two steps forward, but this time 
Abraham doesn't take a step back. Mm -hmm. That's good news and that's progress. Mm -hmm. In your walk of faith, I pray that you too mm -hmm. will take two steps forward and no steps back. Mm -hmm. Until next week, stay well, know that we love you. Yes. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.